Hello, everybody, and welcome to our presentation on Air UI, the Artificially Intelligent Reality User Interface. Next slide. So the goal of Air UI is to create a classifier for gestures made on a wooden surface based on the audio that they produce. And this is to make computers more accessible by decreasing the cost of touch input. And so our approach is with a MEL, spect or a MEL spectrogram for feature extraction and the CNN model discussed later. And that design was based on some literature that we'll go over next. Next slide. In terms of background, we have two major papers from Google and IBM that show great results with CNNs and MLPs on spectrograms and MEL spectrograms for audio classification, as well as one state-of-the-art paper in scratch input from Carnegie Mellon. And so they use a custom apparatus to get 89.5% accuracy on six gesture types. And that's kind of what we're competing against. Next slide. So to collect our data, we sent out some video instructions and ad asked people to record their audio with uh, their phones and tablets to the timing of a metronome. That made segmentation easier, but there was some nuance in the data and that there was different, back, different background noise even across the same samples. Uh, there were different tables with different frequency responses and imperfect timing. And so different gestures also took longer and phones banned pass filters to compress differently per our EC355. And in terms of properties, we had 24 total uh, participants record our, the six input classes listed below. And after cleaning, uh, we had 8,640 samples. Next slide. So for feature extraction, we primarily used a MEL frequency spectrum extracted with Librosa. Input is just a regular feature map and all our trained test and validation sets were evenly class balanced. Decision was based on the background papers again, but it did narrow us to focus on image-based processing models. Next slide. So the MEL spectrograms basically plot frequency versus energy versus time. This is a pink color map. We use grayscale later. The key here is that it's a logarithmic frequency scale. And the end result is that the CNN can learn the same kernels for higher and lower fundamental frequency samples. And conveniently, as you can see on the right, we can recover the time energy and uh, log frequency energy profiles by summing along the columns and rows respectively. Next slide. And so with those energy and um, frequency profiles, we trained two baseline models that achieved 71.2 and 81.2% test accuracy on our full data set uh, with those two energy versus time and energy versus frequency. And so the question is, will our full model outperform this? Next slide. Um, so yeah, so how Having this question in mind, we design a CNN model with the input being the image of the spectrogram and the output is the probability of each class. We used a uh, two convolutional layer followed by three fully connected layer and achieved a final test accuracy of 95.9%. Next, please. Um, in terms of hyperparameters, we use grid search to run over combinations of our variable hyperparameters, which are listed on the right side of the table below. Something to note here is the different image transformations we use here. Because some of the gestures in our classes are longer than others, we need to transform them to the same size. Here we use cropping as a default size since it resembles the real life scenario of cropping a long spectrogram. However, we also explore the effects of other transformations. Next, please. Um, so here are just some examples of the other transformations. For example, the second one on the left is a short gesture being padded with zeros. Next, please. We produced our analytics based on our crop model, and in the top left plot, we have our accuracies, which did plateau, which means that our model did turn to completion, and our validation curve matches our test accuracy pretty well, which is awesome. Then in the top right, we have our uh, ROC curves, which showed very high area under the curve, which tells us that our false positive risk is really low. As engineers, this matters for our project's real-world application because the greatest risk uh, in application is false positives triggering our system when no input is given, as there is more frustration to a user when ghost gestures occur, and this could be destructive. Our confusion matrix shows very favorable results in all classes. Silence is by far the most confused, which is ideal for us because in practice, this just means we have false mm -hmm. negatives, which have very low impact until they cross about that 5% confusion boundary, which we're far below. The other class that we had some confusion on was our circle scratch class, and we're gonna look at why in the next slide. Next slide. Uh, in our qualitative examples, we have some incorrect predictions for a problematic class, and we can see from the top two examples that the scratch, which is the image on the right side, spans the entire frame and can even exceed the frame in length because of our cropping. This makes it appear similar to background noise, and this is compounded by the particularly low signal-to-noise ratio of the circles class. Next slide. We're going to move to our demo now. All right. Oh, that's not what I want. Uh, can everyone see this? Yes. All right.
I almost want to see that twice. <laughs> Actually, I'm using up your time. I'll give you a little extra time. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Okay, let's go back there. Uh, this might get us there. Can you see that? But yeah, so coming back to our slides, um, one thing we want to learn about is the different transformations. For example, cropping here has the lowest accuracy, which is expected because it cropped out some of the important information. Squeezing and stretching has slightly better accuracy. However, they're still distorting some information. And finally, padding has the highest accuracy of 97.15%. Um, and this is because it retains the most information. Next, please. Um, Moving on, what we would do differently is to add more classes, for example, temporal classes, as well as expanding the data set to cover more test subjects. And last but not least, to improve the efficiency, we would um, explore the best small model. Next, please. All right, we hope you enjoyed our presentation. As you can see, it compares favorably to the state-of-the-art paper we presented, and we learned a lot about these time frequency signal encoding methods. Next, we plan on creating a publication for ACM's conference on interactive media systems in January. Thanks very much. All right, great, thank you. It seems like lots of cool work has been done. I found it very interesting. Um, and a remarkable success. I guess one quick question. Um, you had 24 people do this data. Did, is your data set, your test, let's see, you have a training and test set. Uh, is it split amongst people or is it spread across people? Uh, our data sets actually split uh, randomly. So it could include uh, the same people in the different sets. So it is not split among people is the answer to that question. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, so that's a, that's a little bit uh, cheating in this world, but maybe uh, you pointed out something that was early on that I, uh, made me worried and that that maybe fixes um, in a way that doesn't quite work, which is um, uh, that, that there's different backgrounds, different tables and all that. So you're training, you've essentially trained on every table. So uh, maybe you should, you should perhaps realize that if your goal would be to deploy it to someone that you hadn't trained it on. So like the different table, for example. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, uh, that was, I guess, the essence of my uh, next question, which was, there's a nasty problem, the different background noises. You, 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 I think you talked at one point about using a back uh, noise filtering method. Did, did you do that? I didn't quite catch if you did that. Something explicitly uh, filters out the noise. No, so I mentioned the bandpass filtering that phones use when they compress audio. We did not apply bandpass filtering to our actual audio. We let the CNN take care of it. No, I meant actually, that's not noise. Like there, there's ways to try to get rid of noise itself. Uh, and it might be frequency based, but there's other, super, um, I'm not sure if I had that conversation with you, but there's, there's these uh, machine learning based things that are very clever about pulling out noise, but uh, I, I guess you didn't use that. That's okay, I just was curious. Um, uh, I didn't understand what you're talking about in the cropping and squeezing. Can you just kind of run that by me again? Or, yeah, this. What are you What are you telling me when you're doing this? Um. Yeah. So. So, for example, our dub scr w scratch is longer than our um. Let's say fingernail tap. Um. And so, to ensure that all our input images are the same size, we need to kind of transform them to a fixed size. So here we're just choosing different fixed size. So for example, if we choose a smaller size, that means we have to crop the longer gesture to a smaller size. But if we choose a bigger size, that means we have to kind of pad the shorter gesture. Doesn't that mean you need to know what the gesture is in order to pr process it? That's actually why uh, we mentioned in our presentation that we went with the cropped model and that's what we ended up using. Because though we trained on these other three and then tried them out to see how they'd perform, uh, we realized that when we go to actually implement this for a demo, uh, we can't use anything other than cropping because we'd have to know what was coming up next and uh, time travels hard. Mainly it's just to see what information is lost using that transformation. I see, you're just exploring it. Okay, good. So uh, that would have been a yeah, time travel or knowing the answer to the exam before the exam. So. Yeah. <laughs> Not what we're about here. Okay, that's really interesting. Uh, wait, any questions or comments? Um, yeah, everything's great. I'm just wondering about the benchmark. Uh, you guys showed me uh, earlier that you 
start it with a fully connected neural network, which worked great, um, but I'm not seeing that in the presentation. So uh, just wondering uh, what the benefit of using ComNet against the fully connected. Yeah, so we actually, uh, when we had our meeting with you, we actually were kind of confused on our terms and we had presented our prototype to you as our baseline, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of where the confusion came up. So what we presented to you before was kind of similar to what we ended up with for our final model, yeah. but it ended up being kind of like an irrelevant middle step. And that was the feedback we got on our presentation. And so for this one, we, uh, we corrected that by skipping that step in the middle. Um, but that might be still interesting to see uh, uh, how the fully connected network compare with the uh, convolutional, right? It's uh, it's kind of like um, just different models instead of uh, inputs. Isn't that what, that's what I'm showing right here? Isn't this it says 100 hidden neuron MLPs? Yeah, we reran the exact same neural network on the full data set. The prototype was a prototype because, and not a baseline, because it was on a very small data set, just from like my right. microphone. Cool, cool. Yeah, great. Okay, so we, we better move on, but I'll, I'll just ask any quick questions or comments, uh, suggestions from anyone else in the class. Jumping up, great work, guys. It's a, it's a neat project, actually. Well done.